great to be back with you and to be preparing to study the Word of God together. Uh, it's an exciting day. We're starting a, a new book, a new series, and uh, the East Campus is doing the same thing. Uh, you know, the summer we did a variety of things, but uh, from this point forward, our plan is to pretty much go uh, side by side at the same time, and so they are also uh, studying through the book of Galatians over on the east side today. It's a great book. Uh, if you haven't read it through, I encourage you this week, read it through start to finish uh, more than once and make that kind of your, your pattern going forward. Uh, it's, it's a challenging book. You'll have to put your thinking caps on in some places. Uh, I'll force you to put your thinking caps on in some places. Uh, we'll help you with that along the way. Uh, if you know your Old Testament narrative, if you understand how, say, the book of Genesis through Deuteronomy and so on, uh, how that flows, then you'll be uh, very well prepared for Paul's argument uh, here in Galatians. If you're not, you need to catch up a little and refresh yourself on what's going on in those books. Our, our plan is to go through chapter two and then take one week and kind of give a big picture summary of the Old Covenant and the Old Testament narrative so that you can be prepared for uh, chapter three and four and then we'll finish it. Uh, right now, the plan is to finish by Christmas. The clock says 11.40, I'm going, uh, Dwight taught me a long time ago how to ignore those clocks, so uh, I, I see what you all are doing there, but that's not going to work, and we may go till next Christmas, who knows with this letter. Uh, it's, it's, a good, it's a good letter. Um, I would give you a lot of details about the background and the setting and the time and when Paul wrote it and where he wrote it from and all that. If I had those details, I would give them to you. Uh, but those are a lot of the questions that scholars still are not entirely sure of. There's different uh, discussions as to when it was written, and I'll leave you to read your introductions and things to, uh, to figure out where you land. I'll give you a little hint as we go as to which I lean toward. Um, but to the central argument, the central concern of the book of Galatians, it's not absolutely crucial that we have those pieces of information. So I'm not going to spend uh, any time on that. But today I want to give you an overview of the book. We're actually going to go through the whole thing and, and try to set up the, the need for this letter. Why did Paul write it? And hopefully, if we have that as a foundation, then as we go through in the upcoming months, uh, you'll understand why Paul wrote what he wrote. When we come to Galatians, one of the things that we quickly uh, realize is he, his tone, Paul's tone in this letter is significantly different from his tone in most of his other letters. Uh, most of his other letters begin with a very encouraging salutation. For example, am I ready to go with this, Abby? Uh, this is uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 12. He says to the, to the Romans, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness to how unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers, making requests, if perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you, for I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Very encouraging. I want to be there. I want to see you. Your faith is strong. And, and I just, I haven't, he didn't, he didn't start the church in Rome, so he wanted to go meet them and be encouraged by them. Very, very, very uplifting. Ephesians starts like this. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith, Faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. He's, he's excited for them. He's thankful for them. Philippians starts much the same way. Are we going to have that in between everyone? Okay. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Now she's trying to fix it, and I just messed her up, didn't I? Ah. I'll wait. Thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. You, just, you hear the joy, hear the love, the, the encouragement he has for these uh, churches. Colossians, same thing. 
we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. To the Thessalonians. Um... Well, verse two was supposed to be in there, but anyway, he continues on, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. Uh, Second Thessalonians, we ought always give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. All these uplifting things. Even Corinth. Remember we we went through Corinth. Corinth was not exactly the paragon of virtue. It's not the kind of church you want to model yours after. Uh, Paul had a lot of serious concerns with with the church in Corinth, but here's how he started 1 Corinthians. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech, in all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. And then he starts Galatians like this. I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. And then it's all downhill from there. It just gets harsher and harsher. His tone through this whole letter is strong. It's almost sarcastic in places. He gets straight to the point, and he doesn't let up through the whole thing. Uh, if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along, let me, let me just uh, read to you a few of the verses that give us a, a feel for the tone of this book, this letter. Uh, verse 10 of chapter 1. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still striving to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. At the end of what he's saying here, this is a very strong statement. You guys think I'm man pleasers? Well, what I'm about to say, am I pleasing men now? Does this please you? I don't think so, he's gonna say. Uh, Chapter two, verse 11. But when Cephas, that of course is the apostle Peter, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Can you imagine? What would you give to have been there for that? The apostle Paul calling out the apostle Peter and saying he stood condemned. Look at verse 13. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Peter, Barnabas, his close friend, Paul's close friend, they were all swept away in hypocrisy, and Paul calls them out to their face publicly in front of everybody. Chapter 3, verse 1. You foolish Galatians. Do you remember Jesus had some words to say about calling someone a fool? This is no small thing that Paul calls them foolish. Verse three, are you so foolish? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected in the flesh? In verse one, I didn't read it, but uh, he says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who's put you under their spell? Strong language from the Apostle Paul. Chapter four, verse nine. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over? Again, you want to be slaves. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. Maybe all of this work I've poured into you has been worthless and futile and a big waste of time. Verse 16. So have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? This is what I get for telling you what you need to hear is now you're opposed to me, now you're against me, now I am your enemy. Verse 21. Tell me you who want to be under the law 
Do you not listen to the law? It's kind of the modern day version would be, really? Really? Can you, can you read? Can you actually read what the words say? Very strong language. Chapter five, verse four. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. You've been cut off from Jesus. Those are strong, strong words. Uh, moving down to verse seven. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you, that is God, and remember, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. Verse 12, I wish that those who are troubling you would just emasculate themselves. Whew, strong words. And I skipped over in chapter one, maybe the strongest of all, if anybody comes and preaches a different gospel from what we preached, let him be anathema. It could be translated, let him perish, let him be damned. Strong words from the Apostle Paul through the whole book. That's the tone of this letter. Why? Maybe he'd never read Dale Carnegie. This is not the way to win friends and influence people. Maybe he was the first Donald Trump, right? Somebody attacks you and you're going to unleash a Twitter storm of, of counterattacks? No. Remember, Paul has a lot of patience with people who attack him and people who get some things wrong. Again, going back to Corinth. We spent a long time walking through both letters of, uh, of the Corinthians. Uh, they got a lot of things wrong there. And they attacked Paul. The people who were causing all the strife in Corinth, they were attacking Paul personally. He didn't get mad. He didn't get angry. He didn't fight back. He was so patient with the Corinthians all the way along. Now, occasionally, he did lay it out as it needed to be laid out, but he then always came back with words of encouragement. It wasn't until the very end of the second letter that he finally was so convinced that what was going on at Corinth may mean the church wasn't real at all, and he said, test yourselves, you may not even be in the faith. But for so long, he was patient and encouraging and trying to win their hearts. Do you remember what he said to the Philippians? He said, there are people out there who are preaching the gospel, and they're doing it so that it will hurt me. They are hoping that by their proclaiming Jesus and his death and resurrection, the gospel, it will cause me harm, that the persecution will be heated up on me if they do so. And you remember what he said about that? I don't care. I don't care what their motives are as long as the gospel is preached. So why the different tone here? Precisely because the gospel itself was at stake. What was being taught at, in the Galatia area, this is a group of churches in a region, what was being taught here was a false gospel and he had no patience with a false gospel, no tolerance for a false gospel. Christians can get a lot of things wrong and we do. We don't have to agree on everything. I tell our students at NCSC, I don't agree with myself on everything. We're going to disagree they have to agree with me on the test or they flunk, but they don't have to agree with me after the test is over. And some Christians, some Christian pastors and teachers have their heresy meter turned way too hot. Every time you think somebody's wrong, they're a heretic. And we throw that word out all the time. They have a different view of eschatology. Oh, they're a heretic. They have a different view of gifts and things. They're a heretic. Again, Corinth, remember Corinth. They were totally messed up on spiritual gifts, very messed up on church leadership, a lot of things, and Paul was gentle, and, and he, he taught them, he corrected them, he rebuked them, but he didn't call them heretics and say, you don't belong in the church. So we gotta be careful. We, we, we have to allow other Christians to have different perspectives on a lot of things, but the one thing we cannot give an inch on is the gospel. We lose the gospel, we lose everything. The stakes are eternal. 
Imagine a devious medical school that taught their students, future surgeons, that the heart was the appendix and the appendix was the heart. And you go to have your appendix removed. It's one thing to have your, append, your real appendix taken out or your spleen or even a kidney. It suffers, it, it, you suffer for it. It's, it. it's there for a reason. We may not know what the appendix reason is, but it's there for a reason. But if they take the heart out, you die. If we miss the gospel, for, if there are teachers teaching people a false gospel, the consequences are eternal. They could not be more significant. We have to get the gospel right. You can't be wrong on this. And that's why Paul uses the strongest terms possible. If we, if I even come back to you, he says, and preach a different gospel from what you heard, let him be cursed by God. Because the gospel is everything. The stakes are really, really high. So this false gospel that was being taught at, uh, in Galatia uh, came from false teachers. Well, who were they? We get some information about them. Look at chapter 1, verse 7. He says, this gospel, which is really not another gospel, only there are some who are disturbing you or troubling you, and they want to distort the gospel of Christ. We'll talk more about this next week when we look at this uh, particular section, but that, that gets my attention. These people want to distort the gospel. It's not an accident. They want to do that. And then chapter two, verse four, it gives us a little bit more information. Because of the false brethren, don't miss that. They, they're brothers. They claim to be Christians. These are not outside people. These are in the group. They claim to be Christians, but he calls them false brothers. They're not genuine believers at all. These false brethren secretly brought in. They, they come in clandestinely. They, they don't come in really trumpeting what they believe. And they've sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. They want to make us slaves. And they, they hate liberty that we enjoy. Now, as, as we go through here, we will see that these are Jews. They're Jews who, because they're brethren, they're, they're Jews who accept that Jesus is the Messiah. And they accept the resurrection. They wouldn't be considered brothers if they denied those two things. But they say, yeah, 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 Jesus is great. He's great. Believe in Jesus. Believe in the resurrection. But believing in that message is not enough to make you right before God. You have to be circumcised if you're male, and you have to submit to the law of Moses, the old covenant law that's laid out in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You have to obey that law if you're going to be right with God. And Paul says, no, 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 that is a a false gospel. The Jews hated the liberty that the gospel brings. Not all of them. Thankfully, many of them came to Christ and they, for 2,000 years have come to Christ. But many of them, most of them in Jesus' day and in Paul's day, rejected the truth of the gospel and they hated it. Their power was taken away. Their, their, pro, uh, their, their rule over the Jewish people was taken away with Christ. The Jews took great pride in having the law of Moses, just having it. They thought it gave them status as God's chosen people. Hey, we have the law, we, we have the covenant, we are his chosen people. It's as simple as that. They thought it made them keepers of God's wisdom and truth. If you remember in Romans chapter 2, Paul says, you think that you have the embodiment of truth in the law, that now you can be a light to the blind because you have the law. And then he goes on to call them on their hypocrisy, saying, yeah, you have it, but you don't keep it. You're no better than the Gentile. And most importantly, they thought they could keep the law, they thought they did keep the law, and that they were righteous before God. You realize, I'm sure, if you've read your Bible a few times, the reason the Jews 
were the ones who put Jesus on the cross. It was the Romans who actually nailed the nails, but it was because the Jews demanded it. Why did they want him out of their hair? Because he exposed their self-righteousness and their unrighteousness and taught, you're not who you think you are. They hated him and they rejected him. He is the one who spoke most strongly against the Jews throughout his ministry. Read the Gospels again and you'll see this. Uh, he, he overturned all three of these uh, misconceptions. Do you remember the time uh, that Jesus is talking on the Sermon on the Mount and he lays out a lot of wonderful truth, a lot of teaching, sort of the, the kingdom righteousness in his kingdom? And at the end of this, he says a pretty striking thing. At least it would have been striking to the original hearers. Here's what he said. I say unto you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. If you had asked any Jew of his day who were the most righteous people we know, they would have all said the scribes and Pharisees. They held themselves up like that. They obeyed the law perfectly out in public. They, 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 they had gotten rid of all the idolatry. They'd learned the lesson. After all the years in exile, they learned the lesson that God will punish us if we are idolatry, so they wouldn't toler uh, tolerate idolatry. They weren't openly committing adultery and those kinds of things out, out in public. They were toeing the line. And Jesus says, if you all don't become more righteous than they are, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. What's the implication for the scribes and Pharisees? They are not going, they're not righteous enough to enter. They couldn't keep the law, and Jesus exposed it. There was another uh, occasion, which we may or may not be able to look at. Can you go one forward one, Abby? Thank you. Oh, I'm not ready for that one. Go back one. Uh, where Jesus is talking to a, a centurion, a Roman, a soldier, and he comes up to Jesus, and he says, Lord, my servant is, is deathly sick. Would you heal him? Jesus says, sure, let's go. He says, no, 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 no. I don't want you to come. I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. But I know who you are. Just say the word. I'm a man of authority. I understand what it means to have authority, he says. You have a greater authority. You can just speak the word and my servant will be healed. And this is what Jesus said. Abby, when I do this, then you just go. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. The Jews thought they knew Christ. They thought they knew God. Jesus says, most of you don't. But this pagan, this Gentile, has finally seen who I really is, and he has the kind of faith that I haven't seen among the Jews. Then he says some of the hardest things he said anywhere to the Jews. He tells them a parable, a story. He loved to share parables, right? And he, he, he uses uh, an illustration of a vineyard, and he's drawing from Isaiah, and these Jewish teachers would have immediately understood what he was doing. Uh, in Isaiah, God called Israel his special vineyard and how he protected his vineyard and loved his vineyard. And so Jesus says, suppose man has this vineyard and when it comes time for harvest, he sends his slaves to go reap the harvest and the workers there kill the slaves. They beat them and they kill them. And he sends more and they beat them and kill them. And finally the owner says, I'll send my son. And the vine growers say, hey, if we kill his son, we can have the inheritance. And Jesus asked these Pharisees, what will the vine grower do? And they said, he will throw those rotten people out and replace them. And Jesus says, you're right. I'm talking about you. And here's what he says in Matthew 21. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, Israel, and given to a people producing the fruit of it. They thought they had status as God's chosen just because they had the law, just because they were in that covenant. And Jesus says, I'm gonna rip it from you and give it to someone else. And they hated him for it. 
And they hated Paul because Paul taught the same thing. And they hated the gospel that Paul taught because it said we're not under that law. We're under grace. The law, the old covenant, did not, could not bring righteousness. It did not bring righteousness. It could not. Do you remember again when we were in Corinthians? I don't know why I keep going back there. Corinthians, Paul has a couple of phrases he uses to describe the old covenant law. He calls it a ministry. Do you remember that? He calls it a ministry, a ministry that serves, right? That's what ministries do. The old covenant, he said, was a ministry of death, and condemnation. Why? Because as he says in Romans 5 and, and 7, the law aroused the sin of the Jews. The Jews heard the command, don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this, and that provoked them to want to sin more. Well, that brought judgment. Because God said, here are the terms, here are the curses that will be poured out on you if you break my law. And so the Jews couldn't keep the law, and God judged them. It provoked, it revealed their sin, caused them to sin more. The whole point, as we'll see in chapter 4, is it was this fence, this guardian, uh, the pedagogue idea of ancient disciplinarians, to show them their sin so that when Messiah came, they would say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for a Savior. Instead, what they said was, we got the law, we're good. We can keep it, we're righteous. We're God's chosen people. And the Bible says, no, you're not. you've, You've missed it. 600 years before Jesus came, God had foretold of a new covenant that would come. In Jeremiah 31, you may remember this, he says, I'll make a new covenant with him. It's not going to be like the one at Sinai. It's not like the old covenant. That one they broke. That one they didn't keep. But it's going to be a new covenant. And this new covenant, he says, will have two major promises, glorious promises, that make it far superior to the old covenant. The first one was forgiveness of sins. Here's what he says in Jeremiah 31, verse 34. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. The old covenant was designed to remind them of their sin every single day. Day after day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, uh, what's next month, uh, century after century, the Jews disobeyed God and they had to bring sacrifices to the temple and slaughter these animals as a reminder, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. Bring your goats, bring your lambs, bring your turtle doves, bring your animals to the temple and the priest is gonna take them and slaughter them because you're a sinner. But God says in the new covenant, I will remember their sins no more. I will cast them as far as the east is from the west. There will be one sacrifice and then it'll be done and you don't have to remember that you're a sinner every single day of your life. The first great promise, what we might call justification, declared righteous and your sins forgiven. The second great promise was the promise of the Holy Spirit. He says this in Ezekiel 36. Moreover, I will give you a new heart, new one, not like that old one, a new one. I will put a new spirit within you and I will remove that heart of stone. You've heard the term hard-hearted, right? It's still part of our language today. Just hard-hearted, uncaring, uh, uh, immovable, unteachable. Well, the Jews were hard-hearted. He also liked to call them stiff-necked, right? They, They didn't have the internal change whereby they wanted to please God. That wasn't part of the old covenant. There were some in the old covenant that received that, but the covenant itself didn't bring that. But in this new covenant, he says, I'm gonna give you a new heart, put a new spirit. I will remove that heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. 
Not just upon you. The Spirit came upon David. The Spirit came upon Saul. And then he left Saul. He came upon others. But in the new covenant, he says, I will put it inside and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. These are the blessings of the new covenant, the promises of the new covenant that was coming. And these were announced 600 years prior to the coming of Jesus. And so they were waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally it came. And in a word, the new covenant brought freedom. Freedom. Freedom from legalism. Freedom from striving to get right with God through obeying the law because nobody could do it. That's freedom. You put your faith in Jesus Christ and he declares you righteous and you're free from trying to merit your status before God. That's a beautiful thing. It's hope. The other thing is freedom to serve him. Remember we talked about the law aroused sin. It made them want to sin more. Didn't keep them from sinning. Being freed from that law, the Jews now being filled with the Holy Spirit could actually serve God and please him because the Spirit would do that work on the inside and transform them. And you scratch your head and think, why would anybody oppose this freedom? Why would the Jews hang on to it so carefully? The Old Covenant could do neither of those things. Couldn't bring justification, couldn't bring the power for obedience. So Paul has to confront these liberty-stealing uh, false teachers uh, all throughout this book of Galatians. So what I'm going to do, grab your Bibles, and we're going to journey through the letter. Uh, we're not going to read every verse, not going to comment on every verse, I don't think. Uh, but we're going to go through, I want you to see how Paul's argument flows. See, we're we are such a wall-plaque Christian culture. You've all got them in, in your houses. I do too. You got that verse or those verses, one verse on there. And if, if, if someone came up and said, what's the context of that verse? Most of you would be like, oh, I don't know. I'm a good navigator. I, I memorized this in the 221 course. Is that what it's called? We got to have the context. Otherwise, we might misinterpret that one verse. One verse from Galatians that you probably have on your wall or have had somewhere is Galatians 2.20. Some of you could recite it right now, couldn't you? How's it start? I am crucified with Christ, therefore I live. And the life I now live, I live. Who? It's a good navigator over there, very good, yes. But what's the context? That verse may not mean exactly what you think it means. We'll see if it does when we get to chapter two. Uh, we have the fruit of the Spirit in the book of Galatians. You know those. If you grew up in the church and went to Sunday school, you learned that. You learned that the fruit of the Spirit is not a coconut, right? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll have my wife sing her song about the fruit of the Spirit uh, when we get there. Uh, it, it's, it... <laughs> wife, submit, woman. Um... <laughs> She's like, uh-uh. So you know some of these verses, but there's a context. And there's really, only, there's really one argument, one concern of Paul throughout this whole book. And, and so I want to kind of give you the big flow today, and then we'll pick it apart uh, in weeks to come. So in chapter 1, first of all, as, we, as we've already seen, he, he lets them have it. I'm amazed that you're so quickly abandoning the gospel. And he makes a strong statement about uh, false teachers and, and what's going to be done with them. But then the rest of chapter 1 He's, he's basically uh, responding to a critique that the Jews have levied against him. What these guys are saying about Paul, what the Jews are saying about Paul is, you know, Paul, he's just a lackey of those apostles in Jerusalem. He's just an understudy of Peter and James and John and those guys, and he's not a very good one. In fact, he's so bad that he's just trying to um, make you feel good. He's just trying to win your heart. He, he, this gospel that he's preaching is such an easy one. Just believe. Just believe the gospel and you can be saved. And he's afraid of you. He's afraid you're not going to like him if he actually preaches the truth, which is you have to obey the law of Moses. That's their attack on him. And so Paul counters that attack first by saying, look, when I met Jesus, 
Remember that story on the road to Damascus? When I first came to know Christ, I did not go to Jerusalem. I didn't go there. In fact, it was three years later that I finally made it down to Jerusalem, which now you can go back and fill in some gaps in Acts 9. Three years later, I came to Jerusalem, and I did meet with Peter, and I did meet with James, but I didn't meet with any of the other apostles. And at that time, people around Jerusalem didn't know me, couldn't, didn't even know what I looked like. I was only there for two weeks, and the rest of the apostles and the, the disciples of Jerusalem, they didn't know who I was. All they kept hearing was, that guy who used to persecute Christians is not one of us, he's preaching the gospel. So he said, I did not go and learn from Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and those guys. Then in chapter two, he says, then I went back again to Jerusalem 14 years later. I'm gonna tell you what I think he was doing during those 14 years in a couple of weeks. 14 years later, I went down there, and I took Barnabas with me, and I took Titus along, and I went there not so they could instruct me, but he, said I, he says, I went down there and I laid the gospel that I preach before the apostles to see if I've been running in vain. Meaning, not that if they say, Paul, that's wrong, I'm gonna say, oh, sorry, correct me, but maybe, just maybe, those apostles in Jerusalem got it wrong and it's been futile and I'm gonna have to go it alone without them. So Paul's saying, I did not go down there to be taught by the apostles. And he said, in fact, I got there, I told them what I preach, and they welcomed me, and they welcomed Barnabas, and I had Titus with me, who was not circumcised, and nobody said, hey, you need to circumcise him. They extended us the right hand of fellowship, and they said, you go serve the Gentiles the gospel, we'll serve the Jews the gospel, and we shook hands and parted, and it was great. All to say, we didn't go there, I didn't go there to be their understudies. Hardly knew them before this. Then something happens, and we'll wait to get into the details till later, but Peter comes to Antioch, and Paul is in Antioch, and Barnabas is at Antioch, and lots of others, because Antioch was kind of the hub, if you remember, the, they were the sending church of Paul. And while Peter's there, he's hanging out with Jews and Gentiles alike, all Christians. He didn't care where they were from. He's, he's doing what, what we do. He fellowshiped. He ate with them. He, he hung out with them. And then some men from James in Jerusalem came to Antioch, and they delivered a message to Peter. We don't know what that message was. I wish we did. We'll look at some of the possibilities when we get there. But after these guys came to Peter, Peter started pulling back from the Gentiles. He started saying, I'm not gonna sit with them because the Jews thought Gentiles were unclean and you can't sit near the unclean and you can't eat what the unclean eat. So he started pulling back. And Paul sees this and he says, you are a hypocrite. He says, you live like a Gentile free of the law and yet you're compelling these Gentiles to come under the law you're a hypocrite. Even Barnabas, he says, fell for the hypocrisy. Very strong language, and that's when he gets into such that rich passage that includes, I've been crucified with Christ and is no longer I who live, where he spells out justification by faith alone. You cannot be justified by obeying the law. Uh, it, and it's, just, it's just wonderful. There's some thick things in there, though. We're, we'll, there's some uh, rough sledding in a couple of those verses to try to figure out exactly what he's saying, but I'm sure we'll figure it out. And then chapter three, he, uh, this is where, he, where you have to kind of know how the Old Testament works, how, what the storyline of the Old Testament is, because he can assume a lot of things about his audience there, and probably we all know, but when we get there, we'll, we'll give you some background. Uh, but basically, it falls into this line. God made some great big promises to Abraham, huge promises. He says, your name is going to be great all over the world. And kings are going to come from you. And we're going to make you into great nations. But the big one was, every nation on earth is going to be blessed in your name. Everywhere, the whole world. Well, the Jews thought the heirs of those promises were the Jews. And you can understand that. Abraham had a son named Isaac. 
and he was given all the same promises. Isaac had a son named Jacob. He was given all the promises. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He became the father of the nation of Israel. He was given the promises. Even a few times in the Old Testament, it talks about God fulfilling his promise to Abraham. So they thought they were the heirs of God's promises. Paul comes along and says, no. They were a temporary earthly fulfillment, but all along God's uh, big picture future fulfillment was Christ. The promise was to the seed, Jesus. So you could skip from Genesis 12, where Abraham's given his promises, to Matthew 1 and have the complete story. God made promises to Abraham. They're fulfilled in Christ. So the Jews are naturally going to ask, well, then what's the point of Exodus through Malachi? That's the biggest part of my Old Testament, right? And yours too? What's the purpose of the law? What's the purpose of Jews at all? And he answers that question, not the way they were expecting. It was all to show the Jews their sin until Jesus would come so that the Jews who believed could receive the promises and the Gentiles who believed could receive the promises. And he says about you and me, as Gentiles, if we have faith, if we believe the gospel, we are heirs of the promises to Abraham. We are the new, new Israel. We're the fulfillment of everything God promised because we're in Christ, who is the ultimate Israel. Some beautiful things in there, glorious things. But again, it can get kind of thick if we, uh, if we don't know uh, the story. Then in chapter 4, in chapter 4, he, d- he uh, uses this analogy of Israel when they were under the law. They were like a kid who had been promised everything uh, as an inheritance, but he was no better than a slave because he was under age. But when he becomes a grown-up, then he receives the inheritance, and free of all the law that kept them as slaves. And then he turns to the Gentiles and saying, you all were enslaved to idolatry, but now you've been freed from that and brought to Christ, and now you're listening to these Jews and you want to go back into a slavery again? Doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? And then at the end of chapter 4, the last, uh, last half, he uses an analogy that I won't get into now. I'll save it, but it is the most inflammatory thing maybe he ever said to Israel. He called the Israelites offspring of Hagar. If you know your Jewish history, if you know the relationship between the Jews and the Arabs and all that, all the way going back to Isaac and Ishmael, this is the greatest slam Paul could give to a Jew. You are not offspring of of Sarah, your offspring of Hagar. You don't really wonder why he was beat up everywhere he went, do you? I mean, those are fighting words. Then chapter five, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Christ set us free from the law. Us Jews, he's talking about to the Jews. He set us free. Don't go back to it. And then he begins to turn the corner a little bit and talk about the freedom we have in Christ to please God. The spirit, the fruit of the spirit. If you're under the law, the law provokes sin. So the law is going to provoke lust and anger and hostility and all kinds of things that he calls the deeds of the flesh. Impurity, jealousies, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, envying. The law is going to provoke all those things because that's what the law does. But if you're in the new covenant and the Holy Spirit indwells you, what that causes is love, joy. Peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. Did you get them all? should be a song about that. I'm going to learn it so I can get them all. It transforms you from the inside out, and you can and you will actually please God. So much better than being under the law. Now you're free to serve him because he's changing your heart. And he describes some of that in chapter 6, what that looks like, and then he wraps it up. That's the flow of the argument of Galatians. And I would encourage you to to pour over it, read over it, get a sense of how this all goes, and and then we will pick it apart as we go. So to kind of conclude today, 
the question I've been asking and, and I would ask you to think about, by the way, I would encourage you, have some discussions as families, as couples, as small groups, as Ignite, uh, whatever. Talk about these things. It's a very, very practical book. The question is, how is the gospel at risk today? We're not really influenced by true Judaizers. We, we don't have a lot of Jews coming into our church and saying, hey, you got to keep the law of Moses. And, and none of you are being persuaded by that, I hope. Uh, if you are, come talk to me after the service. Uh, so that's not, the gospel is not at, at risk in exactly the same way today. The, the Jews have lost the day. But who is winning the day? Who is trying to destroy the freedom we have in Christ and the gospel today? First question is this. Who wants to make us think that we can be justified before God by obeying rules? Do you know people? Do you know teachers? Do you know churches? Do you know authors? that want to make you think that you can be and should be right with God because you obey rules. As I was reflecting on it, some of the things that I came up with, and you probably came up with them too, and, and maybe you'll come up with better ones, but some, uh, you know, not too long ago, uh, there was a lot of Christians who taught that if you go to movies, uh, if you listen to certain kinds of music, um, you can't be a, a real Christian because Christians don't do that. Uh, now, if they were talking about rap music, I get it. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, somebody told me a funny joke the other day that uh, rap, music is like candy. You take, throw the wrapper out first. Anyway, uh, it's not about movies. It's not about music. But there are those who, who have said, and some of you who grew up in churches like that and were around that, that if you did this, you're not a Christian. Now, we may say it's probably sin for you to watch movies and listen to certain kind of music, and we certainly, much of it's not edifying, but to just lay out the rule, if you do this, you're not a Christian, that's very similar to what the Galatian issue was. Or drinking alcohol, or working on Sunday. This continues. Somebody was telling me a story just yesterday. Uh, a, a gal whose church, whose leaders are working hard to convince their people they have to keep the Sabbath and they can't work on the Sabbath and those kind of things. Uh, Dwight has shared in other circles where the, the, the seminary he went to, if you didn't have the right view of the future of Israel, it was almost like you were a heretic. Maybe even you were a heretic because their understanding of that was so central to the gospel in their mind that you couldn't get that wrong and be a Christian. That's not good. That's not good. That's legalism. That's somebody trying to put certain rules on you. Uh, today, I think of things like some people would put politics in this camp. If you don't have the right to political view, the right political interest, and it could be from all sides, but Christians are this way with regard to politics. It's not that simple. Social work. How much do you care for the poor? How much is your church doing for the poor? And those kind of things. If you don't stop and you know, give a, a dollar to everybody who, who asks you, you're not a Christian. Got to be careful with that kind of thing. Religious tradition. Uh, many people come from certain heritages. And if you're not in that tradition, not too sure you're a Christian. Some go the other way. They reject traditions altogether. If you're in a tradition, you're not a Christian. Got to be careful with those kind of things. Uh, a few years ago, I don't see it quite as prominent today, but maybe 10 or 15 years ago, how you schooled your children often divided Christians, and people who chose one method looked down on the others almost like they were not Christians. Now, we can talk a lot about what's wise and unwise, and we can debate about this and discuss and say, here's what I see, here's what I think, but we have to be careful that we don't say the good news of Jesus Christ is believing in his death and resurrection and ascension and return and schooling your children like this. And of course, nobody ever comes out and says it that way. But if that's what they're believing, they're on dangerous ground, it seems to me. Second question is this. Who wants to keep us from believing that we are free to obey God by the Holy Spirit? Who wants to keep us from believing that? That we are free to obey God by the Holy Spirit. Now again, nobody comes out and says this explicitly. 
but there are some strands, some strains of, of Christianity that sure sound like this implicitly. You know, I, there is a place, for instance, for reminding one another that we are all just sinners saved by grace. That's true. My favorite theologian, D.A. Carson, loves to say that we must always keep in mind that we're just one beggar trying to tell another beggar where to find bread. That's true. But that's not the whole story, and we can take that too far. Have you ever known people, maybe you've been here yourself, where you, you're convinced that whatever temptation you're struggling with, you can't defeat it because oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I can't help it. I can't do anything about it. I'm just a sinner. I'm just going to give in to the sin until Jesus comes back. No! The Holy Spirit has indwelled you. He is giving you the heart that seeks after God. That is not future glorification only. That is the moment you come to faith in Christ. His Spirit is transforming you. Who wants to make you believe the lie? The devil. You can't change. You'll never get past this. You're not ever going to be good enough. Those are lies from the pit. The truth of heaven is, yes, you can overcome this because I will enable you to overcome it. It's the Holy Spirit. Why is it called the Holy Spirit? Well, he's set apart, but he's setting you apart in righteousness. I'm convinced the Bible teaches there is no temptation, not a single one that you can't overcome. In the power of the Spirit, we can. And we run to all kinds of other means and methods instead of seeking the power of the Spirit to overcome. And there are those, I, if, you, if you've talked to Dwight five minutes in the last two years, I promise you, you've had this discussion about those who are, all they talk about is the cross. Now that, if somebody just played that clip of what I just said, people would turn and run, like the, run from that pastor all, uh, what, is, what else is there besides the cross? But the cross brings freedom from slavery to sin. In reality, in real time and space. So when we look to the cross, as Paul will say in Galatians 2, I died on that cross with Jesus, and now I live a life of faith, and that life of faith is a transformed, holy, righteous, God-pleasing life. Do I give in to temptation sometimes? Sure, I don't have to, but I do, and I know you do too. But don't let truncated or one-sided teaching remove the other side. The church has had to deal with, from the ver deal with this from the very beginning. You've got Paul writing so many uh, times about justification by faith because the groups he's writing to are Jews, being influenced by the Jews, and they think they can be saved by the law. But then there's a whole other group that James has to address where James has to say very pointedly, faith without works is dead. And a dead faith doesn't save anybody. So there was already in the early church, the first, uh, first few years, there was this group of people saying, you have to earn your salvation, and another group saying, hey, you know, I've got faith, it doesn't matter how I live. And both are wrong. The gospel brings forgiveness and justification and it brings transformation and holiness and a hunger and thirst for righteousness. And Jesus said, the one who hungers for righteousness will be satisfied. Don't believe the lie from the enemy. Don't believe the partial truth that sometimes you get that, oh, you're just, you just gotta look to the cross and accept his grace, but you're never gonna overcome this sin because you're just a sinner. It's not true. It's not true. You can please God. We are all, as Christians, on the path, the trajectory toward righteousness. Now, we're not all at the same place, and sometimes we go backwards a little bit, and again, we do give in, and when we give in, that's when we remind ourselves, Jesus paid the price for me. And now that I've reminded myself of that, I'm gonna get up, and in his power and his strength, I'm gonna try to please him and overcome the temptation next time. It can be done. None of us, the scripture says very clearly, not a single Christian is a slave to sin. 
Those are the two great promises of the new covenant. Freedom. Freedom from legalism. And freedom from licentiousness. Do you all know what licentiousness means? Kids, do you know what licentiousness means? Can't even say it. We don't use that word. Licentiousness is like given a license to sin. And some people claim that basically the gospel gives you a license to sin. Free from the law, a blessed condition, I can sin all I want and still have remission. No, that is not our song. We are not free to do that. We are free from it. We do not have to earn our righteousness before God, and we do not have to sin. We can overcome. Because that's God's amazing grace of the new covenant. Music team, come up. We're going to sing uh, this familiar song, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. And I know there are different views on whether or not we should put choruses on old hymns. Uh, well, I don't care what your thought on that is. This is a good song. <laughs> because it fits my sermon. When we respond by singing about God's amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. When you sing that, don't sing it as hypocrites. You need to actually believe you were a wretch. You were a wretch, and so was I, until God saved us. But then the chorus, my chains are gone. I've been set free. Free from legalism, free from licentiousness. Let us stand and sing and rejoice in God's amazing grace to us.